Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. I want to welcome everyone on this Memorial Sunday just to, to this time of worship. Our hope and our prayer is that through this time of worship that our God would embrace us. And in that embrace that he'd put us upon his potter's will and that he'd mold us and shape us into the people that he's presently calling us to be. Amen? Amen. Amen. Well, I do have some important tidbits, some very important tidbits to share with you. The book study uh, around Timothy Keller's book, Hope in Times of Fear, will continue again uh, this Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Uh, I cannot encourage you enough uh, to, uh, to check out this book, even if you've not been a part of the study. Go on Amazon, uh, get a Kindle version or a hard copy version of that book. It is fantastic. Uh, if, uh, if you want to talk to someone that's been a part or has been reading that, uh, if anyone that's been reading it, could you raise your hand just for a moment? Just look around. If you want to ask somebody about it, how awesome it is, please see one of those folks or myself. The United Methodist um, men will be meeting on June the 6th at 6.30 p.m. There will be a meal. And the United Methodist Women will be meeting the next day on June the 7th at noon. On June the 7th also we'll be having a finance team meeting at 7 o'clock. And the Christian Layman's uh, Breakfast will be at our church on June the 11th. And I believe that is at 7.30. All right, 7.30 a.m. Just so you know. Also, the Lord's Anchor Committee will be meeting on June the 13th at 7 o'clock. If you were a part of last, uh, the last meeting we had, we encourage you to please come back to continue the conversation. If you'd like to join that and we're not a part, you are also welcome to do so. And here's that moment of truth. Yes, Tim. Community dinner will be June the 11th from 4 o'clock to 7 o'clock, and it will be uh, Italian. All of our community dinners are free will offerings, so please, please, please invite all that you know to come. Anything else you want to say, Tim? Sign-up sheet is at the infamous round table, so please, after service, take a moment to check that out. And if you're available, please sign up. Yes. All right, and when we begin to ask that question, it will come. So the rummage sale is incoming in July, and we are asking you to begin to bring those items, which is actually really kind of funny, because if you go by where the, the room is that we're storing that, there's already quite a bit of stuff, and I say stuff and not junk, but stuff in that room. So please, 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 uh, if you have anything that you'd like to donate, um, uh, go ahead and start bringing that to the church. It is birthday Sunday, so we recognize the May birthdays. that stand for our call to worship majesty majesty worship his majesty All glory, honor, and praise, majesty, kingdom authority, flow from his throne unto his own, his anthem Come. Um. 
together. Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful that we can gather here in your son's most holy name. We pray that you have full the full reign in this service, full reign in our hearts, full reign in our minds, full reign in our lives. Father, today we just pray that you would truly do a work of grace within us all. And we pray that that work of grace would cause us to be a people that embody the love that you are. And all God's people said, amen. Let's take our hymn books to hymn number 380. There's within my heart a melody. Hymn number 380. We'll sing the first, the fourth, and the fifth stanzas. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be. Life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Feasting on the riches of his grace. Resting neath his sheltering wing, always looking on his smiling face. That is why I shout and sing. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my head. I go. Soon he's coming back to welcome me far beyond the starry sky. I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall reign with him on high. Jesus, 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 And now, would you please join me in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
The children are now dismissed to go to Children's Church. I see my son has brought his snake from the zoo from yesterday. So thankful that is not alive. <laughs> Being this weekend is Memorial Sunday, we do have a video that we'd like to share with you. May we as Christians never forget that freedom, it truly is never free. The freedoms that we celebrate here in America, they weren't free. And the freedoms that we experience and the freedom of sin and the freedom of eternal death that cost our Lord his life. So may we never forget, but always remember Remember those that purchased the freedoms that we in this life, that we celebrate. Amen? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, we come before you here on this Memorial Sunday, remembering those that gave their lives that we in America may live free. We pray, especially today, for their families, for their friends, for their loved ones. And we pray that God, that you this day would embrace them right where they are. We pray for a peace to wash over them. We pray for your healing to touch their hearts. We pray that God, where that empty seat is, we just pray that God, that your presence would rest. Father, we ask that on this day, as we celebrate and remember those that have fallen, we just pray that we, the people experiencing this freedom that we would never forget, but that we would always honor and that we would always remember. For this day, Father, we pray as well that we take pause to look anew, to look again upon your son's most holy cross. And we just pray that what he accomplished upon that cross and then three days later in that empty tomb that what he accomplished, that that would take root, take hold of our lives. And now I invite you, church, to pray with me the prayer that our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I was kind of uh, torn about what to sing this morning and then thinking about Memorial Day. And then also just, I don't know about this this year but or this time, but uh, the what was the tragedy in Texas and everything that was going on there. And my heart was heavy and I just, I didn't know what or how we can deal with that. And, and this song just kept coming back in my mind that I felt like that maybe just kind of says it all. And, uh, you know, even though it's just a major tragedy there in Texas, but we've all have experienced a loss of a loved one or something in our time and our lives. Uh, I know it was five years ago this month, I lost my mom. Uh, some of you have just recently lost a wife. Some of you have recently just lost a husband, uh, a child. I, I don't know. Like I said, we've all experienced and sometimes it's hard to know what to say and what to do, but I'm hoping that this song will give some sort of comfort. I was sure by now God you would have reached down and wiped our tears away, stepped in and saved the day. But once again, I say amen, and it's still rainy. But as the thunder rolls, I barely hear you whisper in the rain. I'm with you, and as your mercy falls, I raise my hands and praise the God who gives and takes away, and I'll praise you in this storm, and I will lift my hands, for you are no matter where I am and every tear I've cried, you hold in your hand, you never left my side. And though my heart is torn, I will praise you in this storm. I remember when I stumbled in the wind, you heard my cry to you and raised me up again, but my strength is almost gone, how can I carry on if I can't find As the thunder rolls, I barely hear you whisper through the rain, I'm with you, and as your mercy falls, I raise my hands and praise the God who gives and takes away. every tear I cried, you hold in your hand, you 
never left my side And though my heart is torn I will praise you in this storm I lift my eyes into the hills Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the Maker of heaven and earth I lift my eyes into the hills where does my help come from my help comes from the Lord the maker of heaven and earth and I'll praise you in the storm and I will lift my hands For you are who you are No matter where I am And every tear I cried You hold in your hand You never left my side And though my heart is torn I will praise you in this storm. I will praise you in this storm. Amen. Why don't we? As a church here today, take pause and remember those 19 children and those two school teachers. And Father, today we pray that you would break the tide of sin, that you would break the tide of violence, that you would break the tide of evil within this land. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. This morning we are going to continue our journey and adventure around looking at the resurrection of Christ. And today, I will say, you're going to get a bit of a taste at some point of uh, Keller's book. <laughs> but today's title of the message is not at all what I expected. And it's going to be coming from mainly John chapter 20 and verses 3 through 9. John chapter 20, verses 3 through 9. But not at all what I expected. So a couple weeks back, Sarah got the idea that we needed to try again to host a gathering for her side of the family. Last Christmas, we were poised to host Sarah's side of the family, and days before we were going to host, we got exposed to COVID. Memorial Day weekend was on the horizon, and she thought it to be a great time to host said makeup get-together. I was totally sold on the plan, especially when she said the word ribs. And then after I agreed to us hosting such a bash, she began to get the house ready for company. Doubts then started to enter in my mind. The vacuum started running more often than it usually does. Windows were being washed and rugs were being cleaned and, and toilets were being scrubbed. And I thought to myself, what have I agreed to? And it was in the midst of this getting the house ready for company that Sarah had another thought. This, she thought, would be a great time to paint the rail of the back porch deck. I wondered totally to myself how that was going to help our company have a better time at our house. Again, I thought this entirely to myself. 
but she thought it important. And as the day loomed ever so near to when she planned for us to paint the deck, the wheels of concern began to churn rather rapidly in my mind. So I asked with a bit of fear and trepidation, how long will this painting of the rail of the deck take us? And she said, and I quote, if we all work together, it will only take us an hour. Well, the day finally came, Sunday. And after church, we got our rollers out, got our white paint on, and the painting we all paintings went. Carter, he helped for a good 10 minutes before he somehow ended up with a glob of paint in his eye. To which he said, I think I really should just go and play with dinosaurs now. We all agreed. And then about two hours later, Luke woke up. And Emily was off painting duty and onto Luke chasing duty. And it was then that it dawned on me that we had been painting well over an hour. And then I realized that we had not even got the first coat of paint on the deck rail. The project was not going as expected. I then did the husbandry thing to do, and I pointed out to my wife that she said it would take us an hour to knock this project out, to which Carter overheard and said, yeah, that was before we all deserted her. <laughs> to which Sarah said, oh, honey, as the scriptures say, a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is a day unto the Lord. And I told her in as much good humor as I could muster, Honey, you ain't the Lord. <laughs> Ten hours and two days into our one-hour project, and the deck was done. And to my complete and utter surprise... That deck looks a thousand times better than it did with the old faded wood. The project did not go as expected on the timeline, nor did it turn out as I expected it would. It truly makes a huge difference for the whole look of the porch and backside of the house. So there's many aspects of life that we could aim that phrase at. Not at all what I expected. Maybe it was the first time you flew in a plane. Maybe it was the first time you went to the Big Apple. Maybe it was the first time you attended one of our services in person. Maybe it was the first time you rode in a sailboat. Maybe it was the first time you went to the Indy 500. Expectations in life can, yes, lead to disappointment, but they can also be shattered by the sheer overwhelmingly positive experience that you had with something that you thought was going to be a drab. Deck anyone? Expectations when met can be a wonderful thing. But expectations that are completely blown in a positive way, is it not exhilarating? Life is full of the unexpected. It's full of twists and turns, plot reversals. Things happen to us throughout the living of our days that we never dreamed would be possible. And this unexpected nature of life, I believe in part, comes from the very creator of life itself, God, who often works in unexpected, unpredictable, and ironic ways. And why? Well, he's a person. And he's not a formula. He has a will and a perfect one at that. And being such, he's not constrained to what we think he should do. Rather, he spends his days doing that which he sees best. Which we, his children, are very much a part of the unfolding of what he sees best in this life. That is why in our days... Unexpected joys and unexpected triumphs unfold. When you say yes to Jesus, you have embarked 
just embarked upon a lifelong, eternal long adventure. An adventure that will take you through some valleys and failures, yes. But an adventure that will take you to the highest of mountaintops. To the place of experiencing joy unexplainable. To the place of having hope that truly is unshakable. Which brings us to our passage of scripture. That too is an expression of not what I expected. This passage comes just after Mary Magdalene told Peter and John that she knew not where Jesus' body was. And I invite you to stand for this portion of the reading of God's word. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not initially go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, in this continued time of preaching, teaching, we pray that by your spirit, by your spirit, that you open our hearts and our mind to your word. We pray that you have your way in this time. And all God's people said, amen. You may be seated. So this passage here, this all accord occurred before Jesus himself had appeared to Mary Magdalene. Being such, there were some holes that needed to be filled to answer the big question as to where Jesus' body were. Anyone here a fan of mysteries? Anyone a mystery fan, mystery buff? Anyone, anyone? Mary Higgins Clark, anyone like Mary Higgins Clark? She's got some good books. Uh, shows like Matlock, anyone? Matlock, Murder, She Wrote, you know? Maybe the first eight seasons of CSI? Or maybe a little bit of Criminal Minds, yeah. I, for one, am a huge fan of mysteries. I love piecing together clues. As I'm reading a book or watching a show, do I love to come up with the answer to who done it or how it was done well before the big reveal that comes at the end of the book or the show? Well, first glance with this passage, we may just sort of gloss over the word that's used for look in the phrase, stooping to look in. But getting our magnifying glasses out, getting our Sherlock on, getting our CSI on, we find the following from Mr. Keller. The Greek word used to describe how Peter and John looked at the tomb's contents is a word theabrio, which means to reason, to theorize, and ponder. In other words, they were not merely glancing. They began theorizing about the condition of the grave clothes. They began to posit hypotheses in their minds that could account for what they saw. This is the same reasoning process that a scientist uses in seeking a working hypothesis to explain a phenomenon. Mary Magdalene, and no foul to her, she simply glanced at the tomb and ran. She expected, when she went to the tomb, to see a deceased Jesus. And the deceased Jesus was not in the tomb. Peter and John pulled a full-on Sherlock and Dr. Watson, though. They peered intently into the tomb. They observed with their keen skills of observation the condition at which the tomb was in. First... They saw the grave clothes lying, a Greek word that means to be arranged in an orderly way. The clothes had not been torn to shreds, nor were they in an unraveled heap. 
They also saw that the head cloth was not thrown aside, nor on a pile with the rest, but it was in another place neatly folded. Why would this cause the reasoning prowess to kick it into high gear? Well, when loved ones passed in the first century, they were wrapped in linen strips. They were then laid to rest and looked much more akin to a mummy than how we today think of the deceased. So when Jesus' burial clothes were all folded up and nice little like how Sarah does laundry and not me doing the laundry, folded piles, it caused these two disciples to take serious pause. Why? Would the grave clothes be lying there neatly folded? If enemies had stolen the body, why would they remove the grave clothes at all since the body would have begun to decay? But but if friends had stolen the body, why would they have shown such disrespect by disrobing him and carrying him out naked? If Jesus had just revived himself, well, Why wouldn't the grave clothes have been ripped and shredded? Further, how how could a seriously wounded, barely alive man been able to take them off at all? And even if he had done it, why would he have calmly and neatly folded them up? The powers of deduction at play. John crossed off in his mind every possible natural explanation. Clue by clue, answer by answer, ponderment by ponderment. Every single likely explanation was crossed off his list. And when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And to John's utter and complete amazement, there was one answer left. Just what Jesus had told them. What happened? Miraculous resurrection. No other answer was plausible. No other answer could make sense of the lack of decay, the neatly folded clothing, Only miraculous resurrection. And thus the case was solved. He then, like when Matlock or Jessica Fletcher or Grissom answer the puzzlement of the case, John had found his answer. And as improbable as it was, the scriptures tell us that he, that he believed. Which the word belief here is not merely intellectual assent, but it is a heart faith that brings the perpetual well of salvation. John's experience in that empty tomb was that not at all what he'd expected. He went thinking that some crime, some travesty had occurred. He went to the scene of the crime expecting to see tattered clothes or no clothes at all. He didn't expect to see neatly laying clothes as if housekeeping had just freshened up Jesus' hotel room. And here John teaches us all something that he'd be wise in dealing with God to keep an open mind. Not so open as my grandpa Pops would say that your brains leak out. (laughs) But open enough for God to move in your life in unexpected, unpredictable, and at times even ironic ways. I believe God works in these sort of mysterious, joy-filled to the point of overflowing, like climbing Mount Everest and looking upon the trail that led you to the peak sort of ways for a wide variety of reasons to keep us on our toes yes to keep the adventure a thrilling one yes to ensure that we don't just get into a monotonous routine in a relationship with him yes 
to cause when it is needed most, to cause our hearts to bubble over with unexplainable joy. To remind us, his children, that he, the creator of all that is, is with us. No matter how dark the day may seem. See, it's easy in such a natural viewed life today to carve out from our day to day experiences the divine. We like everything to be measurable, repeatable, explainable. God is not so tame, though. He created all that is, and when He sees fit, He intervenes. He steps into our daily lives by way of miracle and reminds us yet again in some unmistakable way that he truly is with us. It's as C.S. Lewis once said, a naturalistic Christianity leaves out all that is specifically Christian. John's experience in that empty tomb teaches us that we should all make room for God to step into our lives and be the unpredictable God of joy, God of life that he is. He often does the unexpected, not to pull the rug out from under our feet, but rather because he knows best for our lives. We fill our heads, fill our minds with the way we think life should be and the way that life should go. God knows how our lives should be. And when he sees an opportunity for him to step in, to guide or redirect, he does. And when he does, does it cause an eruption of joy, an eruption of life, an eruption of light? within our hearts. I fear these last two to three years, and I'm talking beyond COVID, to the shootings, to the riots, to the economy has caused many people to today to expect the absolute worst in life. We serve a God who is able in a stroke of irony use the most feared reality of all death and make it a gateway for salvation. Make it a gateway for eternal life. The resurrection of Jesus teaches us that there isn't a situation so grave that it's beyond our God's reach. Jesus' rising from the grave teaches us that God can take the very elements of real brokenness in this life and by his will breathe life back into it. It's as John Calvin is recorded in saying, he was sold to buy us back, captive to deliver us, Condemned to absolve us. He was made a curse for our blessing. Sin offering for our righteousness. Marred that we may be made fair. He died for our life. So that by him fury is made gentle. Wrath appeased. Darkness turned into light. Fear reassured. Despisal despised. Debt canceled. Labor lightened. Sadness made merry. Misfortune made fortunate. Difficulty easy. Disorder ordered. Division united. Ignomy ennobled. Rebellion subjected. Intimidation intimidated. Ambushed uncovered. Assaults assailed. Force forced back. Combat combated, war warred against, vengeance avenged, torment tormented, damnation damned, the abyss sunk into the abyss, hell transfixed, death dead, mortality made immortal. In short, mercy 
has swallowed up all misery and goodness, all misfortune. If Christ was able to do that in a three-year span of ministry, then what do you think he could do with the inner workings of your life? With the details that make up your days. The events that unfold within your living. The God we serve in Jesus Christ is the God of resurrection. You may have been let down before. Because of your expectations being placed in the wrong person or in the wrong way. But in Christ you will find the one that will not let you down. But rather will blow your expectations of what this life could be completely out of the water. For in Christ you'll find like John found in the most unlikely of places. In the most unlikely of ways. In the most unlikely of times, hope and joy when you need it most. In closing, let me just say, as there's many times in life that we, after an experience, can think to ourselves in a positive way. That wasn't what I expected. Let me tell you, it happened to me after 10 hours and two days on a one-hour job. It also happened to me about a week and a half ago when I talked my dad into bringing his yard tractor over. Brought that thing over, had the bucket on the front, and I moved about 60 yards of mulch all over the church and parsonage. As soon as I sat in that seat, I was like, huh. And they said, video games can't help you. I had that thing moving, I mean, mm. Many times in life, we as people can look back at a day that we thought was going to be drab and think that wasn't what I expected it was so much better then you know this whole giving your life to Jesus this whole surrendering your will and bowing your knee to the almighty this whole being a follower a disciple of the Lord I encourage you to give it a real chance. I encourage you to not just safely follow him at a distance, but to really make faith in Christ your top priority. To not just think, well, I go to church a few times a month. I'm online virtually all the time. But rather, to give of your heart, of your life, to give entirely, entirely over to him. And we give ourselves to the news and to the media, social and old school cable alike, on a daily basis, don't we? We follow the happenings of this country, of this world, on the hour. Which I believe it is important to be well informed. Don't get me wrong. But what if? Just what if? If we gave of ourselves so consistently and so intentionally to him. If you so take the plunge and do, well, you won't find in him yet another story to disappoint You won't find in him yet another headline to cause you to fear the worst. Rather, you'll find what John found, that he truly is the God of resurrection, and he can and will absolutely blow your expectations of what this life could be plumb out of the water. 
For you'll find yourself not adopting another ethic, cultural trend, but you'll find yourself in a relationship with the non-tame, uncontainable, living God, the Lion of Judah. And being the Lion that He is, He'll pounce into your life, pounce into your day, pounce into your own painting of a deck, pounce into your own examining of an empty tomb, just when it is that you need him to the most. Amen. Amen. We're going to close with a chorus. Um, something beautiful. Let's stand as we sing hymn number 394 chorus, something beautiful. says it all. <laughs> that truly does say it all. Father, in Christ's name, we pray that you do just as that chorus, just as that chorus says, that you, Father, would make something beautiful of our lives. Amen. Before we get a creative and inspiring word from Mr. Jim Turney, I do have a, uh, an announcement to share. Um, this last week, someone that has uh, been a big part of the Indianapolis community, uh, the broom man, he had passed. And uh, the family, uh, through uh, uh, his interaction with us as a church, um, with uh, Lord's Acre, had uh, called and asked me to, uh, to preside over his service. And uh, that service, we'll have the details for you, is uh, at 11 o'clock on Friday. But you never know just how far the reach of this church will go, whether it's through missions, whether it's through the food pantry, whether it's through Lord's Acre. We as a church are impacting lives. And on a good note, on a positive note, and a very joyful note, in the month of May, our food pantry, um, 
was able to hand deliver to folks 122 bags of food, which means about 280 meals were served uh, through the Wednesday food pantry hour through this congregation. Isn't it amazing to just see what God is doing? Yes. You add the 160 that were a part of the community dinner, and you're in the 440s. You add another 50, 60 from the breakfast, and your 500 meals were served through this church in the month of May. Praise God. Jim? If you ever doubt, God does work in mysterious ways. If you ever doubt, remember, God works through mysterious ways as you grow with him. Amen. Amen. Have a safe and happy Memorial Day weekend.